I'm glad I don't know who the, any of these people are. <laughs> Do you have people that you're sort of related to, but they're a bit of an embarrassment? Not in your family? Oh. You have a very unusual family then. What is a normal family? Here's an average family for you. This is according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics from the last census. Are you average? The average Australian is a woman. More women than men. The average Australian is a woman. She's 37 years old. <laughs> well, I'm just going to let all of these comments pass. I'll just read from here. This 37-year-old woman was born in Australia and she has ancestry from the British Isles, English, Scottish, Irish. She speaks only English at home. She nominally relates to a Christian religion. She's, if you pushed her, she'd probably say she was Catholic. She's married. She lives with a husband and two children. Uh, they're a boy and a girl and they're aged nine and six. Uh, they live in a cottage. Uh, it's a three-bedroom house and they have two cars uh, and it's located somewhere in one of the suburbs of an Australian capital city. They've lived there for at least five years and they have a mortgage where they pay $450 a week. That's $1,800 a month if you do monthly. This average Australian has a certificate in business and management she drives one of those two cars to her job and she works as a sales assistant, the equivalent of four days a week. Uh, she also does a lot more housework around the, the home than her husband does. On, on average, of course, it doesn't always apply. Uh, how average are you feeling out of all of that? Um, of, the, of the almost 22 million people that were surveyed on census night, there was not even one single person that met all of those criteria. This is just the average of all of them. Uh, but just so you can feel a little bit average, you at least live in the suburbs of an Australian capital city. I don't know how many of those other criteria you meet. That, that's average. That's pretty normal in Australia. When we come to the Bible, the thing that strikes me again and again, particularly as I read through the Old Testament, is that it's not really a story about thou shalt do this or thou shalt do not. It's a story about a family. And it traces one family through many generations. And you know whose family it is? Well, well actually, it's Jesus' family. The whole, all of those, you know person with an unpronounceable name begat someone else with an equally unpronounceable name? They're, it's Jesus' family tree. But go back far enough, it's also your ancestors as well. We're all part of this one story. And the Bible is a story about family, and about how we are a family. You are part of a family. You're part of actually many families. We'll have a look at some of those. Here's your ancestors, Adam and Eve. Just to prove how dysfunctional your family is, turn back the clock to the beginning. Perfect man, perfect woman, perfect environment, perfect relationship with God. They got it perfectly wrong. They managed to make some dumb decisions. You think you've had sibling rivalry in your family? <laughs> it's nothing compared with what Adam and Eve had to deal with. A dysfunctional family. Your family, by the way. Uh, Noah, if anybody knew God's grace, his saving grace and his power, it was Noah. But we end up meeting him at the end of his life and he's drunk and cursing his own children. Abraham, intent on killing his own son. Uh, his son survives. Uh, he and his wife, Rebecca, talk about a dysfunctional family they're in constant competition with one another and they use their children to spar with, uh, between themselves and uh, end up, well, their children end up a complete mess 
uh, Jacob and Esau. They're, they're twins, but they're manipulative and they uh, play out the things that they learnt from their parents. A real disaster family. Uh, Jacob goes off and he has a herd of children. Well, who amongst us haven't, hasn't planned on selling off at least one of their siblings? <laughs> <laughs> Turn him into something useful like cash. But <clears throat> these, your family actually did it. Uh, David he was someone who was the best of the Old Testament a man after God's own heart and yet even he's not immune from the worst of sin after sin and what a messed up family he lived in you know, his children were at each other's throat and at his throat as well one of them Solomon made a couple of smart decisions early in his career, peaked early, and it was, I'm afraid, downhill all the way from there. The Bible is a story of a very dysfunctional family. Families who get it wrong. Families who come in all shapes and sizes, but families that just make mistake after mistake. And this is one of those lessons where do you do what the Bible shows you to do? Absolutely not. You do the very opposite. Because as a story of a family, it's showing you how things can go wrong and how you learn the lessons so that you don't make that same mistake again. You can learn and find a good way forward. Your own family, I'm afraid, is a prime candidate for learning the same lessons that the the Bible families needed to learn. So here we are. Let's jump into our passage from Mark chapter 3. And the first thing we see is each of us has a natural family. In the natural scheme of things, you have parents and you're part of a family of origin. You are already part of a family. And families, in the normal course of events, tend to care for one another, which is why Jesus' mother and brothers turned up. They're worried about him. He's doing things that the rest of the family did not do, and they're concerned. And so in the natural realm of things, we do look after family members One of the very first questions in the Bible is about family. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain says. Is it my responsibility to look after my brother? And the answer, of course, is yes. He didn't have to from there on in. His brother was dead. He murdered him. There were other brothers and sisters. Yes, we are responsible to care for the members of our own family and nurturing is why God's given us families to give us a good start and part of what we see is the role of a a natural family is a father is to provide for his family and it says in 1 Timothy 5 8 if he doesn't do that he denies the faith not he is a poor provider not he's a spendthrift not He is uncaring, but he has denied the faith. Faith is very practical and it overflows into the way that we conduct ourselves in the normal, natural, everyday way that we relate to our families. It can be worse than an unbeliever. Ladies are allowed to participate as well. The role of family is spelled out by God very early on. So here in Deuteronomy chapter 11, we find God saying, this is the way family is supposed to function. He says, fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds and tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates, so that your days may be, uh, so that your days and the days of your children 
may be many in the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, as many as the days that are the, heaven, are the heavens above the earth. That's how families are supposed to function. And right from the very top, fix these words of mine in your hearts and on your minds as symbols on your hands and your foreheads. Now, good Jewish families sort of bypass a bit of the first line and focus in on the second line. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your, uh, on your head and on your hands. And so a phylactery is a little box and it's got the Ten Commandments written in it. And they are tied around the head and around the arm, the times of prayer. You know, I don't think the Bible was actually meant to be fashion advice for um, this sort of attire. It, it goes back to the first line, fix these words of mine in your hearts and your minds. That's the key message. But the Jews so often took it literally, and here it is, 500 years BC and again they were still taking it literally in Jesus time and they still haven't got the message many of today's people Jews or otherwise still haven't got the message God's word is to be foremost in our hearts and in our minds and how we conduct ourselves and in families Fix these words in your hearts and minds. Teach them to your children. This is how family is meant to function. This is, and no matter what stage your family is in, it's still meant to function like this. Whether you're a single person living alone, a married couple, children, single parent, divorced, widowed... Elderly, it doesn't much matter. Whatever stage of life your family is at, the principle still applies. The place of your home is to be the place where God's word is in your heart and mind and you teach whoever is in your home, even if you're the only person there. You're to be reminding yourself, this is what God's word is about. This is what he says when you get up, when you go to bed, as you move about. It's to be the framework, the frame of your house, your home. So, and reinforced in the New Testament, fathers are instructed to bring up their children in the training and the instruction of the Lord. You know, in your intellect, in your thinking, in your planning, and in your doing. The training is the the working out of it, the instruction is to, this is why we're doing it. But then you have an unnatural family. Well, you think you've got an unnatural family anyway, but I mean, n not your natural biological parents, and grandparents' family. You have another family, and it's also a place where we can care. Now, what is this unnatural family? It's have a look at the person sitting two seats away from you. Oh, yeah, have a look at that person. Mm. You know, that person <laughs> is made in the image of God. That person is part of your family. We are all part of one family just because in the natural realm of things, we are the descendants of Adam and Eve. We are part of a family. And that's partly why you can have good friends who are outside the church, because they're already part of your bigger family. Jesus said, love your neighbour as yourself. And the person to whom he was speaking said, oh, yeah, who's my neighbour? Uh, and wanting to excuse himself. And so Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. And he picked the two people who were most at odds with one another. If he'd picked a Jew and a Roman, it wouldn't have been so bad, but a Jew and a Samaritan, 
was as bad as it could get. What about our context? How do we love our neighbour? What if your neighbour is homeless or Muslim or black or gay or white or Jewish or transgender or calls themselves a Christian or an atheist or a racist or an addict? They're still part of our family. They're still our neighbour. And they're still not further away than Jews and Samaritans of Jesus' day. We're all part of this family. And although it's an unnatural thing to do to care for people like that, whatever that is, it's still the person that God loves. And if God is living in and through us, then we can indeed have a love for this person. Uh, any of these people let's pick out the difference between lust, like and love they're often used in pretty sloppy ways let's try and narrow it down just a little bit Uh, when you lust for someone when you like someone when you love someone what's the differences between those well lust is you you see the good looking sort the hunk, the babe, the, 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 the and and you feel an immediate attraction. It's probably just your hormones kicking in, <laughs> and you don't you don't even know that person. Yeah, you know, they're presented on telly or down the street as, as an ideal person. It's totally superficial, and that's lust. That's not love at all. When you like someone, you go to a deeper level. And it's where you're able to share something in common. Like, you both barrack for the same team. Uh, you, you both like the same foods. You both like the same clothes. You both like going to the same places. Uh, you like them. That happens at the level of your personality when you love someone that comes from a much deeper place a place that might have nothing to do with what the person is like but rather out of God's attitude towards them and he loves them and so lust is just just an observation you, you see it, it's shallow, it's superficial and it doesn't go any deeper than skin deep out of the soul you like someone because you have a connection with them in some way you're able to relate to them in the things that you have in common but love is where there is a deeper relationship that's more than just okay we share similar interests that's where you go to somewhere where God begins to take over I've wrestled again and again with what's the definition of love and out of John 3.16 this is what I've come up with and you can probably come up with a a good one yourself love has got nothing to do with feeling or emotion love is an action word it's a doing word so from John 3.16 for God so loved the world And it wasn't that God had warm, fuzzy feelings for the world. He gave up his only son. That's action. Love is action. So love is doing. And love is doing not just something to meet minimum standards. Love is doing the best. When you go beyond yourself and do the best for the other person, it's not about you at all. Love is about the other person. No matter what it costs, you or them then it's love and love sometimes can be a difficult thing to to make things difficult rather than nicer for example I had someone on Friday ask me for money and what would Jesus do well, I wonder what Jesus would do if a total stranger asked you for money I said no. Uh, 
not that I ever give cash to anybody. I'll give a meal or I'll you know, take them shopping or something, but I'll never give cash. Uh, and this person only wanted cash. And he wasn't happy. Uh, but I wasn't going to enable his continued dysfunctional lifestyle just by giving him more cash so that he could do the same thing again and again. That was a hard thing to do because I'm a rescuer. I like to see people uh, saved. I like to see them in good, healthy, safe places. But he wasn't going to go there. So love is doing the best for that person even though it meant saying no. You've done it yourself. You know, with toddlers. Oh, I want to play in the ni- with the sharp knives. Oh, yes, dear, of course you can. You're such a little sweetie. <laughs> Well, (laughs) in some cases, but (laughs) normally you would say no. No is a love word in many cases, many situations. Which then brings us to the supernatural family that we have. And they're the people who are sitting here in this room with you. We are a family, a supernatural family with supernatural care. And it comes out of John chapter 1 to all who received him to those who believed in his name he gave the authority to become children of God children born not of natural descent or human decision or husband's will but born of God that's who we are we are the children of God born of him so what's that make you? it means I have great worth it means I have unlimited potential it means I can make good choices I can do hard things I am amazing both inside and outside as well it means I'm never alone it means God has the very best plan for my life for me and I know who I am I am God's own child. And those things make the difference. Far more difference than where or when I was born or what I look like or what my possessions are. We want other people to be part of this supernatural family and enjoy these benefits. Our friends in the Churches of Christ did a survey a few years ago and asked their own denomination, what is it that brought you to church? And they analysed all the results, thousands and thousands of them, and broke it into several categories as to what it was that brought people to church from you know, the least effective through to the most effective means of people coming into this supernatural family. So what's about the least effective thing that we can do to bring people into this family? Well, they found that the least effective thing that they could do was to hold an evangelistic mission, to hold an evangelistic crusade, to bring in Billy Graham. Now, people get saved like that, but not very many of them got saved and integrated into the church. Uh, One person out of 200 came into the church by that way. More effective, three times more effective, was to go around the neighbourhood and just knock on doors, tell them about the church, have some sort of visitation program. Just as effective as us going to them is for people to realise they've got a need. It might be a physical need or emotional need, a spiritual need and they come to the church. Now, the survey didn't say whether or not the church was able to meet their need, but it was their recognition of a need that brought them. More effective than that, people walk past and they hear the great music. And they think, oh, that's interesting, and they just come in to have a sticky beak and stay. They're driving down the road and they think, oh, haven't seen that sign before. And they're attracted by just what they see accidentally and so they come in and stay just as effective is some sort of 
program that the church might have, uh, like a, an English language program for new migrants, something like that. Uh, the church might run a program that meets the, the way that the family is set up. So if the family has small children, then a children's ministry will be effective in helping them come. Having a good-looking pastor, or maybe it wasn't a good-looking pastor, a a pastor with some sort of reputation. He was spruiked up by the congregation. And hearing about the pastor and wanting to hear how he presented things was a a better way of uh, bringing people into church. But then that leaves the biggie. More than everything else put together, times many times, What is the most effective way of people coming to church? Do you need three guesses? They just got invited. Someone from the church invited them to come. And far far less effort and far more successful than any other means is an invitation. Yeah, you're having a conversation with someone. You bump into them down the street and you're chatting and say, oh, on Sunday I went to church. And the invitation is able to come. Which is why you found on your seat an invitation card. Now, no one's going to check up on you, but this is something not for you to put on your fridge with a magnet, but to carry around in your pocket, in your purse, in your wallet. We've printed off a thousand of them. So feel free to give them away. And the way to give them away is in conversation as an invitation. How was your weekend? Oh, I had an interesting weekend. Saturday, went to the footy. Sunday, went to church. You might be interested in our church. Here, I've got this card. And... Have a look at it, feel it. It's an attractive card. Um, It looks good, it feels good, and it gives the basic information. Who we are, Life Church Panania, what we're on about, faith, hope, love in action, when to turn up, 10 o'clock Sunday mornings, and whereabouts, right here. And if they want to know more, we've got a fabulous new website where they can find us. Give away the cards. Now, no one's going to check up on you and say, how many have you given away this week? (laughs) It's not a competition. It's just have a couple handy and if you get the opportunity, if the Lord opens up that opportunity, then grab it and just slip the card in. Say, oh, you might be interested in our church. And there it is. And they have then in their hand something practical, something useful, something that is a reminder, something that's a bit difficult to just forget, something that they'll see later. And it's a conversation all over again. So please use the one that you've got and there are plenty more for you to pick up and use and carry around, give away. It's not the only way of doing things. If there's a man in the house, Elnor and I have given away this fabulous DVD, uh, a great Christian message uh, that is aimed at men who need to hear a good Christian message from other men who are living in the real world that are blokey blokes. So all of us are the children of God. How did we get to be part of this family? Through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptised into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are part of this family tree, the seed of Abraham and heirs of the promise. You get to inherit what the family inherits. You're part of this family. It's good news. Now, our text from, Matthew, uh, from Mark chapter 3 ends up with Jesus saying, whoever does God's will is my brother, sister and mother. And so it's whoever. There's 
anybody out there who can be part of the family. For God so loved the entire world and everybody in it that everyone is potentially part of this family. Whoever does God's will. It's not just think, oh yes, I believe in God. Satan believes in God. The demons believe in God. But it's whoever does God's will that makes a difference. And what is God's will? God's will is that you get saved and that you live out your salvation in realistic ways, no matter what your family looks like. And so it's my family. And your family looks different, certainly decade after decade, possibly even year after year. This is your family we're talking about. This, the group of people sitting here with you, these are your family. They have a supernatural care for you. We don't always show it well, but we're in... Yeah, we're a dysfunctional family. Oh, you knew that already. And so it's here where we practice not just training in righteousness, but it's here where we practice the virtues of the Christian faith. Grace, forgiveness, compassion, love, and growing towards maturity that is Christ-likeness. That's why we're here so that we can be the family that God wants each family to be. And then we can take who we are becoming here and translate it into our own homes, whatever family situation your home looks like. Because the love of God is overflowing into us now and then through us as we go out to live out family however the family looks. So let me pray for us. Father, thank you that you love us, you care for us. Jesus died for us. He lives for us and he loves us moment by moment. Oh, may the love of God so fill us individually, us as a church family, that we've got something genuine and substantial to take back to our own homes where Jesus, again, lives and loves in us, for us, through us, in spite of us, to do the things that please him. And so may God be blessed in and through all that he does in our big happy, dysfunctional family for Jesus' sake. Amen.